Hello and welcome back to 365 Days with MXM Tune. I'm Maya, a singer, songwriter, video maker, Oakland native, and a supporter of Black Lives Matter. I'm also a huge fan of history. I love untold stories, gross facts, hidden secrets, and anything weird, dark, and funky from the past. Each day, I'm going to share one of my favorite deep cuts with you. So let's take a look at today's stories with an important trigger warning before I begin. This episode contains a discussion of police brutality, killings, and violence against black and brown people. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365 with MXM on this day in 2020, federal law enforcement officers began a phased withdrawal from Portland amid criticism of their actions against Black Lives Matter protests. President Trump had sent the agents to quell protests. Instead of bringing order, the federal presence was, in the words of Oregon's Governor Kate Brown, like adding gasoline to a fire. The militarized federal response resulted in a disturbing escalation of violence and abuse of power, bringing national attention yet again to the realities of police brutality. Let's reverse. On May 25th, 2020, in Minneapolis, a black man named George Floyd was murdered by police officer Derek Chauvin during an arrest for allegedly counterfeiting a $20 bill. Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds, while Floyd and bystanders begged for him to let go. Video of the murder was shared across the world, provoking global protests against police brutality. In Portland, Oregon, community groups organized peaceful protests in the following days. The Portland community was already familiar with this type of protest. In 2003, a police officer in Portland shot and killed a 21-year-old black mother of two named Kendra James. The event galvanized activists and minority communities in Portland and served as a turning point in the city's activism against police brutality. In 2020, as Portland rose again in protests, the Portland police response was immediately controversial. Citing incidents of looting and vandalism, police used tear gas and impact munition to break up the mostly peaceful protests. The police response was deemed so extreme that on June 10th, a judge issued a temporary order banning the use of tear gas by Portland police, except in a case of lives being at risk. In the ruling, the judge wrote that tear gas had been used on people who were, quote, engaged only in peaceful and non-destructive protest. There is even evidence that some protesters were confronted with tear gas while trying to follow police orders and leave the demonstrations. Shortly after, President Trump signed an executive order to protect federal monuments, memorials, and statues during the protests across the country. On July 1st, following Trump's executive order, federal law enforcement showed up in Portland without permission from any local or state officials. The Department of Homeland Security and the Trump administration justified this action by citing the new executive order and claiming the federal agents were there to protect federal property. According to Portland's mayor, local officials, and journalists on the ground, the federal presence instead turned Portland into something like a war zone. Oregon Governor Kate Brown described the actions of the federal agents over the next few weeks as a blatant abuse of power. Federal agents were accused of pursuing protesters with tear gas and riot gear far beyond the borders of the federal property that they were sent to protect. They were seen jumping out of unmarked vehicles and seizing protesters without sufficient information to charge or arrest them. A protester named Mark Pettibone shared his story of being grabbed by unmarked federal agents. A van pulls up right in front of us. I'm basically tossed into the van. I had my beanie pulled over my face so that I couldn't see, and they held my hands over my head. Without explaining what was happening, the agents took Pettibone to the federal courthouse, patted him down, took his photograph, and put him in a cell. They released him 90 minutes later, giving no reason for his arrest. Pettibone said, It was clear to me that this was just a totally indiscriminate detainment. By July 17th, the ACLU, the Oregon Department of Justice, and the U.S. Attorney for the District of Oregon began pursuing lawsuits against the Department of Homeland Security. The protesters, too, rather than being dispersed by this abuse of force, simply fought back harder. Larger crowds gathered to protect protesters and defy the use of force by federal agents. Oregon's governor, Kate Brown, spoke out to the federal agencies, saying, Please take your officers home. They are only escalating things here in the city, and you need to go home. On July 29th, Governor Brown announced that she and Vice President Mike Pence had reached a deal to remove federal officers from Portland and replace them with local and state police. 
On July 30th, 2020, federal agents began a phased withdrawal from Portland and departed to standby locations. After a month of escalating violence on a daily basis, on July 30th and 31st, protests were largely peaceful again. Of course, this isn't the end of the story. Black Lives Matter protests across the world called into question the violent response of federal, state, and local law enforcement. Calls to defund the police ask officials to evaluate city budgets and reallocate some of the enormous police budgets to social services, education, mental health care, and much more. In July 2021, the Biden administration is facing public tension over the continued need to address police brutality and accountability. Our voices are still needed to advocate for change. Now, let's talk about music. July 30th, 2003 was not Justin Timberlake's best day. It was the day of the Molson Canadian Rocks for Toronto concert, the biggest concert ever held in Canada, with up to 500,000 people attending, also known as SARS Fest. The concert was a benefit to help revive Toronto's economy after the SARS outbreak earlier that year. Side note, SARS was actually a disease caused by a type of coronavirus. Many scientists took the outbreak as a warning for a far worse outbreak that could occur in the future, predicting the devastating effects of COVID-19. The concert featured a lineup of mostly rock bands like the Rolling Stones, ACDC, Rush, and the guests, who? Justin Timberlake was one of the few pop acts invited. The crowd, expecting a hard rock concert, booed him while he performed and threw water bottles and other projectiles at the stage. Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones was visibly angry with the crowd and gestured at them to stop. Justin now talks about the trauma of the experience, but adds, kids, be tenacious. And now for today's final segment, I'll be going back into my own photo archives to see what I was up to on a July 30th in my life. Thankfully, it wasn't getting water bottles hurled at me, like Justin Timberlake. On July 30th, 2018, I found a license plate that had OO on it. O-W-O. I thought it was funny. I took a photo of it. That's my exciting fact for the day. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> Thanks for going back in time with me and remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Come back tomorrow for more stories from the past. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365.